This is a Rook Media Series, The Contemporary History of Iran, Part 5. Welcome to the Contemporary History of Iran, a series from Rook Media. This is part five, the creation of Kanun. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Our aim with this series is to explore the events, personalities, and issues that have shaped modern Iran. We want to do this as much as possible through a non-traditional lens, through snapshots of change and using alternative voices or angles. This series is mostly in English and will feature a new episode posted every Thursday across our Rook Media platforms. We will post subtitled excerpts with Farsi Zirnevis on our YouTube and Instagram sites. We are coming to you on rookmedia.com. It is there that you can link to all of our platforms and we invite you to check out parts one through four of this series that are already posted. The Contemporary History of Iran is brought to you in part by Yazdani Law Group. YLG is one of the largest Iranian-Canadian immigration law firms. Their mission, rooted in the leadership of founder Afshin Yazdani, is built on continuously striving to innovate and introduce new immigration pathways for their clients. Afshin began his career as a lawyer and law professor in Iran, and his company has now made it their goal to provide the best, simplest, least risky, and most inexpensive way to immigrate to Canada. YLG has an impressive track record. Hundreds of applications from Iran successfully processed each year. They are at YLGPC on Instagram. That is Yazdani Law Group. All right, let's get started. Here now is the Contemporary History of Iran, Part 5. Well, we live in an age where children's literature, films, institutes, and creative learning centers are a given. But it wasn't so long ago that specialized libraries and cultural hubs for non-textbook learning were virtually non-existent for kids anywhere in the world. And that included, of course, Iran. But that changed in the 1960s. Ask any Iranian who has spent any time in Iran in the last 60 years about a cultural center and network for the education and growth of kids in the realms of everything from books to poems to films to painting and sound, and they will have heard of an iconic institution with a simple name, Kanun. In fact, it would be no great exaggeration to make the case that this institution single-handedly shifted the cultural landscape and creative DNA of young Iranians from the mid-20th century forward. So what exactly was Kanun? What is it today? And how did one of the most progressive systems for the cultural education and creativity of kids anywhere in the world begin in Iran? Well, it is our good fortune to have the person who was at the genesis of the project in Iran in the 1960s as our feature guest today. Lili Amir Arjamand had a central role in creating libraries and cultural centers for kids and teens in the final 15 years of the Pahlavi dynasty. She was the managing director of the Institute for Intellectual Development of Children and Young Adults, known as Kanun. She was also the head of the National Library and an associate professor at Tehran University and a board member of the Museum of Science and Technology. Lily was born and raised in Tehran and attended the Razi School, where she was the classmate of the future queen, Farah Diba. She continued her studies in the United States at Rutgers University and then returned to Iran to hatch the idea of a children's library that would become Kanun. 
After the revolution of 1979, Lilly moved back to the United States and played an executive role in merchandise management at Saks Fifth Avenue for many years. And this year, Sight and Sound magazine crowned her as one of the key architects of the new Iranian cinema. But to tell the story of the creation of Kanun, right now, Lily Amir Ajamand joins me from Naples, Florida today. Hello. Hi. It's very nice to be with you today. It's a, it's a great honor. You know, I read an article about you where you were described as a technocrat with imagination. <laughs> How do you feel about that designation? I hate to be called a technocrat. <laughs> I prefer the imagination side of the comment. <laughs> well, it's kind of an inspired moniker because it's it's a little of both, isn't it? You probably couldn't have created what you created without being something of a technocrat, and yet yes. you certainly couldn't have done it without the imagination. <laughs> yes, indeed. So you were a young woman, a uh, young Iranian woman in your 20s studying at Rutgers in the U.S. Yes. When you When you have an idea for a kid's library. Now, before we get back to Iran and pitching the idea to uh, the Queen Farah, just tell me where you got that idea while you were at Rutgers. I studied library science and children's literature at Rutgers. And in the meantime, wh while I was studying, I also visited one library in near Paris in France, Bibliothèque de Clamart, and that was the first time that I saw mobile libraries. They were like buses with, um, instead of seats, they had all these shelves and the mm -hmm. They would go from one place to the other and the children would come borrow books and then give back the ones they already had. And that was like a revelation to me. All these ideas that you called like <laughs> for the uh, future that we did at Kanun, I sort of got inspired by what the, the things I had observed and seen during my travels in various countries. So in 1964, if I have the story right, you're in your mid-20s. You've received this education, this graduate education. I was 23. 23. Don't <laughs> age me here, please. <laughs> your early 20s. Why? Well, 23 could be mid. <laughs> your early 20s. You've received this graduate education in the U.S. You've returned to Iran. Your old classmate happens to now be Queen, Queen Fada, and you yes. propose the idea of a children's library. And if I have the story right, at this stage, you didn't have the whole Kanun all mapped out. You just wanted to build one library, right? Exactly. That's completely right. And I asked Her Majesty if she was okay for us to have one public library only for children in Tehran. That was it. And she was very excited about the idea, and she's the one who got us the first land we got, which was in um, Parque Farah. I don't know what they call it now in Tehran. They have changed all the names. And we got the land, and they you know, started looking for an architect. The whole idea started at that point. The architect that was chosen was... Ardalon, he was very known in those days. Uh. He also contributed for the plans, and I had asked him what to put on the plans because they had no idea, you know, what a children's library should be. Like just reading, or you could have other activities in there. And that's where the whole thing started. So, just to put this into context, and forgive the naivete mm -hmm. of the question, but so there were libraries in Iran, but there was no such thing as a, there was no, kids library at all there was no kids library they might have had some schools they might have had like a corner or even sometimes a room where they would have uh, they would have a few books for kids but it was never like a proper library i had a friend of mine mrs homa zahedi who unfortunately has passed she was the sister of Ardeshir Zahedi, whom you probably have heard of, of course. our foreign ministry and everything. Anyway, she was one of my best friends. And the two of us, we would get in the car. We bought some books on our own. And we would drive to the south of Tehran, where are the poorer areas, as you probably know. Yes. And go into public schools 
and talk to the headmistress and stuff and uh, then ask them to let us lend these books to the kids. We started really the school libraries, like in my car, taking the books mm -hmm. to the south of Tehran. And that's how we did that until the, the big library was finished. I want to get to I want to get to that what you were doing for poor kids and working class kids. But two steps mm -hmm. back, let me just uh, ask you a bit more about that meeting with the Shaponu with with Queen Farah because uh, I, you know when when I had the conversation uh, as part of the series with uh, Dr. Leila Diba about um, uh, Queen Farah hiring her as a museum director in the mid seventies, and even at that point. Uh, Farah Diba is still only in her early 30s and she's hiring this this young woman. When you have this conversation in the early 60s, not you're not just 23 years old. Queen Farah is really young as well. I mean, yes. it's amazing the foresight and the um the 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 progressive sort of revolutionary ideas that um she had or or she was willing to jump on at that young age yes she was very open to all new ideas and um that's the, the really a privilege that we had to have her in that sense but i must tell you if his majesty wasn't behind the queen none of this could really have happened so quickly and so nicely his Majesty was also for doing this kind of uh, things and having this kind of activities. You know, you mentioned your interest in helping the kids in the in south of Tehran, mm -hmm. and um, y you were fortunate enough to come from privilege. I I'm curious. You know, it's not necessarily a given that someone who comes from privilege is going to help out those who, who don't. In fact, there's many folks who, who don't engage in that kind of activity. Why do you think you took such an interest in wanting to help disadvantaged kids and, and wanting to focus on working class kids in terms of the intent and location of the first library and, and delivering those books? I'll tell you, I want to correct you a little bit, and that is that the Lycée Razi that we went, uh, that Her Majesty went to, I went, that was the continuation of our studies at Jean d'Arc uh, in French. And we went to Lycée Razi afterwards to get our high school um, education and degree. But this Lycée Razi was situated in the south of Tehran. So mm. every day when we had to go, and I was living in Shemran, as you know, it's like really up north. My father used to drive me all the way downtown to Lycée That was not in a wealthy area. It was actually in a very poor area. And that's when we came in contact with the kids that were going to the Iranian school neighbor to us, the way they were dressed, the way they were reacting. So I was exposed to that. I didn't know I was going to become a librarian in the future. But I was exposed to their life. It's not that I had this privileged life and I had never seen poverty. You know, you weren't just built, you, I mean, it's not just delivering books. Um, and, and you weren't just even building you know, kids' libraries by the 19, say, late, late 1960s. You were repurposing existing buildings in working class neighborhoods. I mean, the whole thing is so progressive. Like, like how ideological was this mission that you and, and Homa Zahidi had? Was there a, a master plan or were you just doing this brick no. by brick? No, there was really like today they have plans from day one to whenever the project is finished, everything is orderly. We never had a plan. Ideas were coming, we would take action and it would expand and expand and expand and other subjects would be added. Like who would have thought that a library with books would eventually have films and would have uh, records and would have music and theater. No, it wasn't in the plans. It just came as we gradually advanced. When did you know it was working, Lily? I mean, did it, when that first library opened, was it obvious that this was this idea was a hit? Oh, absolutely. Since day one, these kids, you know, they, they didn't have anything. They were playing outside in the, the uh, dust and everything. Uh, and all of a sudden, here is 
these are these two ladies very nicely dressed who come <laughs> and they have a room in the school and they, they have all these books and the books are colored and uh, they would rush and they would just put them against their chest and this gesture of the kids putting a book against their chest continued I saw it again and again when we were traveling in the provinces in the villages and these kids who had never had anything would have a book and they would put it against their chest it was that precious it's a, it's a beautiful image and you you say um the the books with color and you know in in learning about this i learned that part of the incentive part of the idea around these libraries was and these spaces was to create a colorful space because yes. so much of where the working class or the poor kids would be had to, to study would would or you know where they lived in fact was was drab would be dark colors would be uninspired and so part of it was actually literally bringing color to their lives yes that is totally true and again, this came little by little because when we had an already done room or a construction uh, in a school, all we could do is really go paint the room and put some colors. And then when we started making our own furniture, small furniture for the library for kids, then I introduced the colors and I said, you have to put color. You know, we are not going to sit here in like gray colors or whatever. It's going to be red. It's going to be yellow. It's going to be green. Yeah, it started there and everybody loved it. And we continued. Was there a lot of demand right away to get into these? Yes, we had a lot. of, And that's why I had to start the publications department of Kanu because we didn't have enough books for children. They, they had done some translations of foreign books before, but it wasn't something serious, really. It was on the side of publishing books for adults. That's why we said we have to have a publishing department that makes only uh, books for children. That's fascinating. I want to get to that. I, before we do, you, you, Dr. Ehsan Yarshatur, yes. who Iranians will, of course, know that name, comes up with the name. He coins Kanun. Uh, yes. Of course, the, the, the entire name is a lot longer, uh, and I, I'm, I'm terrified to, to, to get it wrong. <laughs> but, can, <laughs> but can you tell us why Kanun? Kanun means like uh, the house, in a, in a way. Hune becomes Kanun? Not Hune, but the center, I would uh -huh. say, you know. And yes, Dr. Yorshatar came with the idea of Kanun Parvarish Fikri Kudakan Manu Jawanan. That is so hard for you to pronounce. In Ghadaram Sakhnis, but it's, I, I, I'm a little scared of it because I know you have to say it with the right intonation, otherwise, people don't know what you're talking about. Um, what did it mean? personally to become the first managing director of this official non-profit non-commercial socio-cultural institution accountable to Shahmanu Farah what what did that mean for you and your life at that moment I was only thinking I want to be the head of this organization so I can do whatever I want <laughs> the title and Modir Omel and all of that really didn't mean anything I didn't need that I was on top of the society in any case because I was the friend of the queen, uh, not of my own merit, <laughs> but um, in receptions, in all the, uh, you know, parties even at night, every time I would go, it, I had a plan in my head. I'm going to ask Timsar Mimbashian, General Mimbashian, who was head of the army, I'm going to ask him to give me buses. He gave me 12 buses from gendarmerie. And we took all the seats out and we put shelves in them. We painted in blue with the bird of Kanun on the sides. And it became a mobile library. These were my first mobile libraries, the buses of the army. B by the way, where did the logo come from, the bird? Uh, That's a good question. There was a very young student of Tehran University, a young man, who we had put the, the logo on competition and he's the one who drew the Kanun, the bird sitting on a book, if you see yes. uh, an open book. 
and he is the one who won it and uh, became the logo of uh, Kanu. A young student, he was like 19 years old. Everyone behind this thing is young, you know. That it's, yes. it's a very, it's it's amazing. I mean, it's now this. We didn't have anyone over forty in my organization. <laughs> <laughs> right. I was one of the youngest myself, but we we had others. Neither of us would be allowed in the club now, uh, I guess. So, <laughs> <laughs> if if you if you got to be under, under forty. Maybe they let me in. Right. Because of my seniority. <laughs> uh, by the way, why were you so ambitious? I mean, what w- this idea that wherever you would go to whatever party that you had this I- plan of how can I build this thing? Where did the ambition come in you? I don't know. It was instinctive. I I just it was coming out of me. Hmm. <laughs> but I I was not just you know flimsily going there and asking for stuff. I knew exactly that tonight I will see so-and-so and and I'm going to ask for such and such. Hmm. I even had lunches with the Prime Minister, Mr. Hoveida. May God bless his soul. He was so nice to us. And I would go every week. We had lunch together. And then I would tell him my problems and he would help me. I was getting help from everybody. You know, only four years after you have this initial idea that you pitch in 1964, Kanun had become this remarkably streamlined production house for first-rate cultural goods aimed at children. How did it spread from a simple idea to national cultural mainstay so quickly? It wasn't that quickly because when I left Iran, we had about 200 35 or something uh, construction library not the mobile and that just you know like solid libraries mm-hmm. we decided uh, I mean the, the queen and I we decided that we should have these children's library all over Iran it's not fair that we only have it in Tehran like many people will only put their attention on the capital city we had to go and Again, I tell you, my idea was to go to the poorest area, to the um, remote villages. And I don't know if you have heard or not, but we had mobile libraries on mules <laughs> with the curds, and they would put the books uh, you know, on the two sides of the mule and ride it up the mountain where they had the tents. Wow. And you know these people in... in um, very close to Shiraz, there is there are tribes, a lot of tribes, and uh, it's all like mountainous and all that. And this, the local people, I couldn't do that. So the local people would come, and we hired them. We hired these men who would ride the mule and take books up to the mountains. I have gone myself, like with a jeep, and at some point the jeep couldn't go any further, and they had made stairs in the mountain for me to be able to go up. Hmm. Like they had dug out the the soil so I could put my foot and go up until I reached the top where they had their tents. And it was amazing. It was amazing. Their tents were made with, with, uh, you know, the carpets and the the, the gilims and all of that and the women were dressed with their gold all around their necks and on their head it was unbelievable uh, part, was part of the reward. amazing part frankly especially uh, looking back through the lens of uh, the 21st century um, where um, people's attention spans have shifted to looking at uh, the gadget in their hand part of what's amazing is the appetite the hunger and the clear appreciation for books, that these people wanted these, that the, the kids wanted the books at that point, huh? Yes, and not only the kids uh, were wanted the books, but the parents were interested. So the child would come, get the books, and go home and read to his mother and father. <laughs> so they all enjoyed the same book, so we ha- we were reaching an entire population through one book. And so you'd created this kind of ecosystem of these 
mobile libraries uh, that were by the late sixties. They were in every in the in the big cities across Iran. Right? They were in the big cities uh, in the form of uh, buses and that, and then we had uh, the jeeps that were taking in harder areas, and we had the mules, as I told you. They were not even horses; they were mules taking in some parts. I mean, we we used every kind of transportation that you can imagine to get books to these people because they it was unattainable with just a car or a bus. So I, you talked about getting into publication in 1967. Kanun begins getting involved in publication. Um, mm-hmm. And and I was going to ask you what did that provide that was missing until then? You said uh, that it provided books that didn't exist. Talk talk to me about that. Uh, uh, this idea takes off of the kids' library. At what point do you realize? Wait a minute, we <laughs> we need books for these libraries. Exactly, we didn't have enough books, in my opinion. And guess what? The first book that was published by our publications department was a book that. Her Majesty had illustrated herself, and the, it's you know the little siren by Anderson, and uh, yeah, she had illustrated that book, and that was the first book that was published in Kanun and sold. So we started having a budget to publish books. So I'm telling you, she was very involved, and she was always contributing whatever she could. When was the um, eureka moment where you realized that this w- was going to be or needed to be more than just about books, but uh, but about all different creative sort of forms from cinema to, to painting to audio? Well, it wasn't really a eureka. It was gradually... And again, during my travels, I could see like in the United States or in Europe, the libraries had films or they had records in those days. We didn't have tapes, we had records. Oh, and a lot of our inspiration also came from the Eastern European countries, surprisingly enough. Mm. They are so talented about publishing and 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 uh, you know illustrating books the beautiful books they have so i would come back to iran and i would say okay let's start mix- making music so i had to hire a musician the composer then put the story on it and then we had the book with a story and a, a, a record that was stuck inside the cover of the book mm-hmm. So you could read the book and you could listen to the story accompanied with music. And we we introduced Mozart and Beethoven and Chopin. This way, they would also start learning about classical music that in a million years they would never have encountered. Again, we are talking about kids that are not privileged. Sure, but also we're talking about, I mean... Correct me if I'm wrong, but because you're saying you got all these inspirations from different parts of the world, but um, this idea, not of course of a kid's library, but of something that would morph into a cultural center and all with all kinds of different arts and cultural facets for kids, for young adults, and for for children. This was not just a new idea for Iran, but it really didn't have a lot of antecedents anywhere in the world, did it? No, and it still doesn't. It was, I think, I believe firmly until today that that was the only place in the world that it was done this way, the way it was done, like they had everything. And that was again gradually, but in the end, children's libraries were culture centers that had everything for kids and young adults. We still don't have anywhere anything like Konu. As somebody who didn't grow up in Iran, when I was telling people uh, that I was going to do this interview and, and asking a little uh, around a little bit about Kanun, um, some folks talked about it as, almost like it was a lifeline. It was a lifeline <laughs> to culture and arts in a place at in a time, especially those who are talking about post-revolution as well, that where there's really no other access to uh, a lot of this um, this material and these resources. Yes, but remember, before the revolution, I also, they used to <laughs> call Kanun 
Lune Zambur, which means the beehive. Mm -hmm. Why? Because a lot of young uh, people who were in politics and not always royalist, they had stayed in, in various jails at periods of their life. Mm -hmm. I would get them when they were <laughs> released. I would hire them because they had the talent. Oh, he has the politics, okay. He has his ideas, okay. But he has a talent to write. He has a talent to draw. He has a talent to make films. And uh, actually, I reminisce because I recently, uh, you have heard about Paris Sabeti, uh, the number two of Savak, yes. the security yes. Yes. Uh, in Iran. And um, I met him, and then every other day, I had the telephone in my hand saying, they have taken so-and-so, can you please release him? <laughs> well, I, listen, I've got to, let me explain this to people, because I, I wanted to get to this. This, to me, is one of the outstanding parts of this story, uh, of how you did this, because it, it is quite remarkable that in this period, so we're now in the late 60s and 1970s, Kanun mm -hmm. retains its autonomy from the Pahlavi regime and even resists oh, Savak, whose directors, as I understand, considered Kanun to be at times some epicenter of leftists, uh, including, as you say, employees who had been arrested or blacklisted uh, mm -hmm. dissidents. But you're doing this with the support of Shaponi Fara. Can, can you talk about yes. how you were able to walk the line with this growing this cultural, is the cultural irony institution? Of it. This yeah. is the irony of it that I was part of the imperial court going there like two, three times a week. But I, I gathered these people, and you know what? Now he tells me he was happy because these people were controlled. <laughs> <laughs> I would make them work so hard they didn't have time to go for politics anymore. So they liked me. <laughs> but how how difficult was that to support, say, uh, blacklisted filmmakers who were uh, who, who who were allowed to make films for Kanun when they could not get jobs elsewhere? It wasn't difficult for me. I, if I liked something or if I had read a scenario somebody had written, I said, let him go and make the film. But, you know, we need the permission. Okay, I'll get the permission. <laughs> that was my job. So they would start working. And I, I'm telling you, they were so busy <laughs> that they had no time to do other things. You know, I wanted to encourage them to like this regime, to say, but look, the Empress is wonderful. The Shah loves you. Uh, why do you have these ideas? And so when we had like an opening of an, our international film festival that the Queen was always inaugurating, I would actually take these people and ha introduce them to the Queen. Hmm. And of course, the security people, <laughs> people hated me because they were on their toes. And nothing ever happened. These are human beings. You are kind to them. You give them enough to work on and you have, they can, they can it's okay. I love this idea of quelling a dissent by getting people to work their ass off at Kanun. <laughs> <It's just laughs> the, the way, to, to, the to, way to get rid of the activists, no, uh, employ them. Said, and, yeah. When they had these big invitations, say I go to the palace and usually we used to wear long dresses, evening dresses. So on my way back, I would stop at a pizza place and buy big boxes of pizza and bring them to Kanun before I go home. Like it's two o'clock in the morning. And we were like on the eve of our festival. So everybody was in Kanun working. And I would walk in with pizza. Okay, here's the break. And I would bring in my long evening <laughs> bring pizza for them. It was different. You know, they they accepted me the way I was. I wasn't always nice. I would really reprimand them harshly time to time. But this is what I was doing. They loved it. I would walk in with pizza at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Sounds like you're a pretty tough cookie. <laughs> it was great. What was the intent behind establishing that first international film festival for children in 1966, which thereafter becomes a pretty big deal. Yes, because of my position and that with Kanun, 
various countries and various organizations had heard about me, especially that I also had been invited to come give lectures, say, at Columbia University in the U.S. or various other countries in Europe. So, I, so they sort of knew about me. And they had, one time, they invited me to be a member of the jury in the International Film Festival of Moscow. I went there, I was a member of the jury, and that was my inspiration. Oh my God, we have to have an international. This, the, the one in Moscow was not for children. But for me, okay, I want to have an international film festival with films for children. That actually started a whole wave of uh, various uh, studios to start making more films with children and uh, films that where children were the main actors. You know, that's how it started, that we would get all these movies. And the name started really growing and everybody wanted to be part of this international film festival for children and young adults in Iran. But, you know, when you win a prize this year... Uh, for for being a key architect of uh, the Iranian new wave cinema, uh, I mean, I, there's there's a, undoubtedly a lot of reasons behind that, uh, the things you've done throughout your career. But I've got to think that those filmmakers who became who who we loved around the world, uh, art house or big filmmakers uh, from Iran uh, through the 1970s and then into the 80s, 90s. Um, these guys, I mean, and, and I know this to be the case with someone like Kira Stami, they, they found their their footing through this festival and through Kanun, right? Yes, they did. And um, I wanted to say something about Kira Stami because he, as you very well know, although you haven't been in Iran, he was like the number one filmmaker in I my opinion. I do know opinion. that. Well. Yes. Um, so he, his first movie that he made, it was a 10-minute black and white movie called Nonu Kuche, meaning um, The Bread and the Street, something like that. Um, and it was like less than 10 minutes. And then the, his boss, he was just a young man working in the film center. Uh, his boss came to me and said, well, we have this film of Kyoros Dami. Do you think uh, we could put it for the festival? I, you know, they were hesitating. I said, let me see it. So I had my own private projection little room. So they brought it for me. I saw the movie and I came out and I said, not only it's going to be in the festival, it's going to be on the first night when the queen comes. And that's where Skiarostami started. <laughs> and he, he was a genius. He was wonderful. In the in the course of a decade, you said some you, you gave some stats earlier. Let me let me repeat them or or underscore them here. Kanun goes from fewer than ten libraries concentrated in the in in Tehran uh, yes. with a with a total personnel of less than twenty, and this is ni in nineteen sixty six to the status of a multi purpose center by the mid seventies with two hundred and twenty two libraries serving also as cultural centers, 30 mobile libraries throughout the country, a workforce of around 1,000 librarians, over 1,000 serving at art training shops and support services. How much of a challenge was it to manage the rapid growth of Kanun by the mid-late 70s? In other words, had it grown too big too fast? Mm, I don't believe so. I... Um First of all, as I said, I was only working with young people who didn't mind working 24 hours a day, but uh, which is not good, of course. But um, no, because we had a lot of centers when I left Iran, and now there are even more. They have continued to add to those centers. I think they have like over 800 centers, kanuns, cent how do they look like? What kind of books are there? I really don't know because I haven't been to Iran for 43 years. But they still have it. That's the only institution that wasn't closed down after the revolution. And they start, they, they continued expanding those libraries. Am I diverging here? Not at all. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to ask you about that in a moment, that okay. how, how Conan... Um, what's happened over the last 40 years. But no, I mean, the the I had read that it was 
it became harder and harder to manage and and funding became a bigger issue as as it obviously would as it grew uh, and the appetite for it grew so much over that decade um, so I never had a problem with my budget I always we had the board of directors of the, the chairman and all of that I would get the budget I needed I would go to the director of Bank Melli and say give me money <laughs> No, I never had our uh, the plan and organization, you know, Sazman Bahname. I never had problem with my budget. Never lacked money. Hmm. That was very fortunate for you. Tell me about 1979, Lily. Your your final days in Iran as the managing director of Conrad. I can only imagine it must have been a confusing time at best and a devastating time in terms of wondering what the future would hold for for this baby this uh, that you had created uh, mm-hmm. 15 years earlier tell me about that period well you know when you're so close to the source of power you really don't realize how close you are to be done you know we we always thought this is just some movement around and you know it's going to pass and it's not it was it's not going to be serious until the last minute and we had a code with the uh, the empress uh, that if really it becomes horrible and we have to leave um that she would give me that code and then yeah one night at 11 o'clock she called and she gave me the code and i knew we had to leave so i had four children of my own at that time i wasn't thinking of what is going to happen to kanun i was thinking of mm. saving my life and my kids life right. but let me tell you something because of what i had done for so many years there was a young man who was working for air france and he had been a member of the library and when i called air france to get tickets there were no tickets available Do you know that this young man I think dropped two people to give the tickets to me? Wow. And that's how I could get out of Iran because if I hadn't I would have definitely been executed. Because the next day I left they had invaded my house and taken over. Wow. Yes, that young man saved our life by giving me tickets. Can you tap into the emotions of that time what 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 do you think of when you think of those final days and and that basically that escape you become numb i i because my husband my ex-husband was completely devastated he was sitting there just doing nothing so i had to manage everybody's life whether it was my life or the people coming in front of my door crying my my librarians what are we going to do and i had to calm them down just go back do what you have to do just work as if nothing is happening do your duty and I, like we were really tough and then i would come home and i practically oh my god what am i going to take how are we going to do this it was horrific but you know something we did it we managed did you think when you left did you think that you would be returning to iran a lot of folks no. thought I knew I wasn't going to. You knew, huh? Yes, I knew. I mean, there were certainly people who hoped that it would be, you know, uh, a lot of people go back to Iran now, as you know. But I can I'm a persona non grata because of my friendship with the with the empress. So if they don't go back, I don't go back. What did you it's understandable that you said you were more concerned about saving your fa- family's lives than than Kanun in the moment but when you end up leaving um what do you find out is happening with the the libraries back home and 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 all the projects that were being run for quite a while i had absolutely no news um after things had settled down and the actual revolution had happened and then the, i i used to get news from iran you know drips and drops of news um and they said you know the the, the mullahs have not closed the libraries and they're working and that made me so happy i said because everything that had been done was destroyed it was bad <laughs> but they didn't touch the libraries 
they left it there and it continued. As I said to you, I don't know what the quality is today. I don't know what they are giving these kids to read, but the libraries are still there. And that's what makes me happy. It's quite something that Kanun uh, couldn't be killed. I, I, I mean, yes. there was a, I, from from what I've read, I mean, there was a period where it sort of went dark for, uh, a, 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 I don't know how, how long, months, a couple of years, whatever. But that uh, you, you can't keep a good idea down, I guess, that that that, that um, uh, Kanun was sort of resuscitated and, and uh, has even grown in the last 40 years. Yes, it has. It has. It has. It never was shut down never like everywhere else they had closed uh, the offices but my people were there and the last day that I was there I had given my resignation to the queen um, I went and all my colleagues were gathered in in the conference room and I made a speech and I told them you continue working I'm going away for a while but you continue working don't lose track of the aim we have. And uh, some of them were like men, big men. They were like crying. <laughs> Tears were going down. Yeah. But I was tough. I, I, of course, I broke down after I came out <laughs> to my office. But at that point, I said, you continue the same way you did it now. You continue no matter what happens. And they did. Why do you think that Kanun has survived and thrived because it had a solid foundation they couldn't find anything to say they couldn't say that lily amira joan was a thief she had taken the money the budget they did nothing they couldn't they went they they went through all the accounts my uh, financial guy who's now also in the united states he told me he said, you don't know, Mrs. Adjoan. When, when you left, they came, they were going through every single account, every single book. They never found a penny that had been misplaced. So if they, an organization is so clean, how, what would their excuse be for closing it down? They had no excuse. You know, the name of this series is The Contemporary History of Iran. Um, it's such a, a great pleasure to talk to you. Before I let you go, I, what what do you believe the most important takeaway is about the story of Kanun from the perspective of learning about and embracing the modern history of Iran? My take is that the fact that Kanun has survived means that there is hope for Iran. There is hope for the gen new generation. And you know something? Before I finish, I received two or three emails from 19 years old from Iran who had heard about me and they said, you're an idol for us. I don't know how they had heard about me and what I had done, but they probably were members of the libraries. They write to me. So it, it's something they could not the 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 rulers could not destroy and that's it anything that has a foundation has purity and has good will in it nobody can destroy it no matter what and a final question to you that i'm thinking about that air france pilot that, that <laughs> not helped. pilot oh he wasn't he a pilot was working in the yeah ticket agent yeah. <laughs> air, air france worker <laughs> The, the the person who helped you guys get out. Uh -huh. I mean, this this is the power of someone who's touched by something that's been so important to them, um, you know, in the formation of who they are. Um, on a personal level, when you reflect back and or you do an interview like this, or, what are you most proud of when it comes to Conan? I don't know. I'm proud that it was me and I had the opportunity to achieve whatever we did achieve in those years. And then it didn't fade away, it continued. I'm proud of myself for having been able to do such a thing that didn't go away. But I, again, I have to repeat, if it wasn't for the support of Her Majesty and the budgets I could give from various 
ministries and everybody helped me. It's not my thing, it's us. I always, they were always laughing because they were saying when you do interviews, you never say me. You always say us, me, us, we did it. <laughs> and it's true, it wasn't me. It was a whole group of young people who did this for Iran and thank you God, it's still there. I'm very proud of that. Lili Amir Ajaman, it's been such a pleasure. Um, I had the opportunity to talk to you. I thank you so much for being part of the series. I thank you for your insights, uh, your memories, and your foresight. And uh, I hope we get to talk more in the near future. Inshallah. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Lili Amir Ajaman. The Managing Director of the Institute for Intellectual Development of Children and Young Adults, known as Kanun, through the 1960s and 1970s. She was also the head of the National Library in Iran and an associate professor at Tehran University and a board member for the Museum of Science and Technology. We reached Lily in Naples, Florida today. This is full time for the Rook series, The Contemporary History of Iran, Part 5. Brought to you in part by Yazdani Law Group, one of Canada's largest immigration law firms, YLGPC, on Instagram. Please check out our regular editions of Rook and all things related at rookmedia.com. That's our website, rookmedia.com, where you can find previous episodes, our guests, videos, funnies, all of that there. And please subscribe on all of our platforms. Thanks to the amazing team who make Rook Media happen. Producer Susan, Ponce of the Artist, Fabulous Keon, Super Parisa, Savvy Roham, Ahai Merthod, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shia. Thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you've not done so already. Find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. Mizun Mashi. Mizun Mashi.